How's it going ladies and bruises? I'm Bobby Sixkiller and welcome to Torment Tides of Numenera. Now in the last episode we murdered a bunch of guys as we are in the habit of doing and then we walked up the stairs to a clearing which appears to be a town so we might be in store for a reasonably uh let's say dull episode where we just walk around town talking to everybody and trying to figure out what the fuck is let's going go. on. So if you're not into that and not combat then this will be the episode for you but otherwise yeah. Be a while for combat, I imagine. In the shadows cast by the fold of the merchant's cow, you glimpse hints of verdant chitin and amber mandibles erupting from the pale human flesh. Her voluminous robes cannot hide the fact that her movements are off, as if too many joints inhabit too little space. But her voice, her voice is a warm, tumbling flood of spoken thoughts and impulses. A fair afternoon to you. Warm, isn't it? Something begins humming in one of her many pockets and her brilliant, multifaceted eyes flicker towards an invisible point in the distance. Well, not as warm as it could be, but this is the warmest minute of the week by a considerable margin. She trails off, but the hum continues. Oh, you have one of those tattoos too. Anyway, can I interest you in some prime artifacts, dusty relics, new manera of uncertain origin? I've never visited the city before, can you tell me about it? No, she laughs. And it sounds like the cloud of insects taking flight. I'll do better than that. Tell me anything about this place that worries you, and I'll make it better. That's a guarantee. What part of the city should I see first? All of it. Take it from me. Everything's worth seeing, even the boring bits. Take your time. Talk to everyone you meet and keep your eyes open. Are there any dangerous areas I should avoid? Not at all, Prada says, waving her claws at you. I heard so many rumours about how the underbelly was ruled by vicious thugs, but when I went down there to make a trade, no one so much as glared at me. She hesitates. Of course they were probably worried I was going to snip their heads off, but the underbelly is fascinating and worth the risk. Most everywhere is. I'm still finding my way, think I could get a discount on your goods? <laughs> well, she says, looking momentarily uncertain. It's like watching a lone cloud passing across a summer sky. You know what? I'll give you a discount on everything I carry. From now until the last star in the sky collapses. Or, you know, one of us dies. Can't do a thing about that. She laughs again, clearly unworried by the prospect. Let's talk about something else. Absolutely, she says. Something whirs beneath her cloak and she spots playfully at it. <laughs> I like this vendor. Awesome. I'm looking for someone to help me com repair a complex machine. Can you help? Ooh, I'd love to. Complex machines are my favourite, but no, I shouldn't. I'm really behind on work orders this month. This may surprise you, but I'm very, very, very easily distracted. She shrugs beneath her robes. You're better off with someone else. Sorry. You appear to be transforming into an insect. I know. Isn't it fantastic? I think it might be caused by the intermingling fields of the new Monero I used to organize my thoughts. All the ones I'm selling. Maybe all of them. You never know how a variety of ciphers will interact with each other. It's such fun. You said someone else had a tattoo, had my tattoo. Who? Oh right, a pale lady. She wanted me to fix an artifact of hers, but I couldn't make any sense of it. And that is rare, believe me. Pa Prada sighs. I feel sorry for her, to tell you the truth. She seems sad. Like she'd lost something and was never able to get it back. When is that discount we talked about? Okay, so we got ciphers. We got a bunch of random shit. I don't even know what we sell, what we keep. I don't know. You've got stuff. I want a gun. You have guns? No. Alright, let's go talk to someone else, I guess. You? Oh, you don't have a name. I don't want to talk to you. You don't have a name. You do. Zalfi the Sculptor. This portly man's cracked and bleeding hands are always moving. Picking fretfully at his thick lips, running through his thinning hair or moulding aimless shapes in the air. His clothes are marked with paint, dust, dried blood and clay. His eyes brim with frustrated tears as he studies the strangely familiar sculptures arrayed about him. A soul like slivers of ice, he mutters, fingertips long, shriveled, sharp, screams trapped in flesh. She holds him in place. She's killing him. He's not looking at her. Why? Why isn't he? Afraid? No. He claws absently at his sparse beard. What am I not seeing? What am I missing? What's wrong? 
Everything! He says without a moment's pause, effortlessly drawing you in his self-directed tirade. Every detail is almost right, which means everything is wrong. I am Zalfi, stone carver, sculptor, divine painter of living eyes, and in this challenge, my greatest work, my talent has finally abandoned me. He sweeps a scornful hand at the sculptures. Behold my art, wanderer! Witness these dull stumps, these crude replicas of a sublime being. What is it you think I've made? What is that? Am anamnesis? I don't even know what the fuck that is. Try to recall why the sculptures look so familiar. 80, that's not bad. Nice. You stare at the sculptures, your memories flow into its sweeping curves, teasing you with what you've seen in your short life and beyond. Yes, this towering thing is the true form of the creature that pursues you. Zalfi has sculpted the sorrow. You don't realise you've spoken aloud until you hear Zalfi's gasp and see the tears in his eyes. Yes, sorrow, or even grief, is present in the work. I feel it, but where? I cannot pull it from the stone. I saw this creature on a cold night not long ago. Smoking coronas of blackened light drew me to my window, Zalfi says, shaping the scene with his palms. And there on the street below was she, gripping a man in her talons before my very eyes. She ripped his essence from him, leaving him a steaming husk. He drops his hands. But what do you care? You don't grasp the importance of capturing such a subject. Uh, let's see. I've seen a aspects of him. Maybe I can help you capture the details. Zalfi stares at you dumbfounded. You think I'm trying to sculpt the killer, he says. Then he immediately corrects himself. Of course I am. I've succeeded, in fact. She is beauty and vengeance incarnate. What artist worth his metal couldn't capture such a being? Zalfi clucks his tongue. But she doesn't need to be remembered. How could anyone forget such a lethal creature? Silver tide raised? No, the source of my ruin is this damnable man. Zalfi points a trembling finger at the faceless human, cradled in the statue's talons. A charred, oddly familiar pattern etched on the stone head. He stares eternity in the face, and did not blink. But he will be forgotten unless I capture him here. And I cannot do that unless I knew what drove him. Shit, where am I? There. The moment he fell, I ran for the street. But the Dendra O'Hur claimed his body and took it away. Probably to their foul chapel in the underbelly. Now I'll never know who he was. Um, tell me about the Dendra O'Hur. They are a cult and a curse, Zalfi says. They would have you believe they exist to preserve the great works of humanity. To celebrate life. You may even believe them until you smell their breath. The truth is they squat in the underbelly chapel eating corpses and claiming it gives them power. Is there anything else you can remember about the creature that killed your subject? What a surprise, Zalfi says. With a ragged, scornful sigh. Yes, let us ignore the incandescent flare of the stranger's brief life and focus on his murderer. She is so much more glamorous. He grips his sparse hair as if it's going to fall out and glares at you. That's what you want, isn't it? That's what everyone wants. The creature is hunting me too. I need to learn everything I can about it. Read a book then. Pester a skull arc with your questions. For all the good it will do you. And when the beast claims you as well, spare a prayer for the artist who drove himself into a grave trying to capture your final moments. Man, he's an asshole. <laughs> if I learn anything about your subject, I'll let you know. I'll remember that. Quest received. Nice. Done. There you go, we got a thing to do. And that's in the underbelly, I assume. Oh, I forgot to... Tol McGurr. Hi. As you approach, the wild-haired woman eyes you speculatively and whispers something to her companions. They burst out laughing, and a slight smirk plays about her lips. A breathing mask dangles from a cord around her neck, and you can see where it has cut permanent grooves into her face. She ruffles her hair, messing it still further, and sings out, Come to buy a slave cast off? If you've come to me, you must want something of the sort. How do you know I'm a cast off? The tattoo. I've had dealings with your kind before. I know about you. She breaks her fingers through her hair. If anything, the motion serves to obscure her vision even more. 
So, Kastov, I have information you might want. Of course, it comes with a price. What kind of information? You think you'll get it from me that easily? I don't think so. I know your type. You Kastovs. Not a one of you can be trusted. I give you this information, you're gone before I can collect my price. So you'll forgive me if I decline to say outright what secrets I hold. Making a note. One of my wards has run off. She's taken a head wound, not my doing. And I've been watching after her. I don't know where she's gone, but I suspect she's headed to Cliff's Edge. Plenty of other urchins clamoring about the place, and she'd find it easy to blend in. Sadly, my troop and I are de de detained here, so we can't go ourselves. She's a scrawny child, name of Rin. Head wound, but it's covered by dark, curly hair. She has a necklace around her throat, baubles about her gods. Go get her for me, and I'll tell you what you want to know. Sure. Whatever. Don't take long, my time is valuable, cast off. Doing okay. it now. I don't even know where Cliff's Edge is. Watch how fast I can run! Oh my god! Kelnor? Paja and Kelnor. Who the fuck are you two? Paja. This couple stands together, their shared gaze fixed away from you. No words pass between them, instead, they share a silent language of tenderness. Their bodies turn subtly towards each other, forming a private space between them. His hand reaches for hers, and without looking, she claims it. Still looking past you, they smile together. He is a curving line carved in oak. Hers, as unabashed and radiant as a lantern on a starless night. Turning, you see the object of their attention, the young boy darting between the stalls and playing in the dust. Each distant, exhilarated shout widens their respective smiles and tightens their grip on each other. Is that your son? Yes, he says firmly, still watching the boy. But a weary stillness has spilled into his posture. She swats his shoulder. And there's more punch than playfulness in it. Not yet, she says. We adopted Jerem. And we're waiting to see how he feels about that. Aren't we, Kelnor? His eyes flicker stubbornly, but he doesn't respond. What brings you here? Jerem likes it, Kelnor says. The stern expression around his eye stern eyes softens somewhat. We don't have much time between shifts, Paja explains. All money to spend on flipperies. So we bring him to the market and we can watch him play. It's better than a night at the theatre. Kelnor raises their clasped hands and kisses her bruised knuckles. Why'd you decide to adopt? Smooth, kid. That's just the kind of thing people like talking about with strangers. Oh, I'm not embarrassed, Paja says, eyes gleaming. We love telling the story. Well, Kelnor and I... We've been together for... how long? Years, Kelnor says, a glint in his eye. And we knew we wanted children. So we tried and tried, we tried a lot. Some days, I barely had time to put my clothes on before Kel took them off again. Go on. <laughs> Paja raises her eyebrows but continues. Well, there was poor Kel, practically falling asleep on the shift, forgetting his trousers half the time, and me with nothing to show for it but a glow on my cheeks. Clearly we were working with a barren field. All faulty seeds, Kelnor adds. Deadpan. Does run in the family. So we decided to find a child who needed a home. Rather than tr getting old trying to make one of our own, Paja says. That answer your question? Sorry, I'm gonna need more details. <laughs> ha! Paja says, sweating at you. I like this one, Kel. He hardly blushed at all. She leans in and lowers her voice. We get asked this question a lot, and finally, we found that being... Explicit about the process usually makes the questions just melt away. Very well. Ah. Yes. I want to hear all about your sex life. Tell me everything. Everything! Otero. Wind spins off the distant sea, sweeping between you and the boy, whistling up toward the peaks of Sagus Cliffs. He glances at you, then at the crowds in the plaza beyond. He appears to be looking for someone. Saw you wandering down on the reef, he says. Did you get to that star before the others did? He looks back at your face and grins. Guess not. That and a face that's found a good pick. <laughs> a lot of people went looking for the star, did they? Nah, not too many. Gotta be a kaka to go down to the reef. The place is haunted. Blue tide rays? I still know what that does. But despite his hard words, as I settle on yours, studying, deciding, his mouth settles into an irritated line. Look, he says, 
running a hand over his stubbled scalp. You hide it well, but I can tell you're new here. I ain't trying to offend you. But I don't like leaving new folk to Sagus on their own. If you have questions about the city, or Circus Minor in particular, I'll answer them, free of charge. Of course, it looks like you already have a guide. His eyes straight faced to Elagoon. Although you might be better listening to someone with taste. Or anyone else who doesn't think living in the underbelly is a good idea. A little extra advice never hurt anyone, Elagoon said placidly. Not everyone likes sleeping under the stars. Or fresh air, the boy replies, grinning. Or self-respect, Elagoon rolls his eyes but subsides, smiling. Anyway, Oteri says, what do you want to know? Do you live here? Not really, he says. Walls are nice, but they keep you in one place. I like to move around. Explore. You don't have a home? Don't need one, he says. I carry my life with me. He pats his bags. I'm looking for the cult of the changing god. Making a note. Well, you're not going to be able to miss him, he says, smirking. They're camped around that weird clock on the other side of the square. He settles his hands on his hips. What do you want with those carcass anyway? They owe you something? I just need to ask them a few questions. Fair enough, he says, shrugging. Even carcass get it right sometimes. So we're in Circus Minor now. Yeah, the heart of the city, he says, folding his arms. The levies and politicians will tell you that the government square is the centre of Sagus Cliffs. But they're not thinking right. He spreads his hands, far framing the plaza. When folks come to Sagus, they come here. They talk and trade, flirt and fight, tell stories. Everyone who comes here leaves different. His hands fall. Anyway, what do you want to know? Does anyone around here know how to fix complex machinery? Hmm, he says, scanning the plaza. Prata? That's the bug lady in the market. Is pretty good with machines. You might ask her for advice. He rubs the back of his necks. Otherwise, you want to visit the foreman in the underbelly. They might be able to fix it if they can stop fighting long enough. What are you doing here anyway? Just got back from a scrounge, he says. I'm here trading salvo for supplies before I set out again. Enjoying the sights, you know. As I sweep the crowds again. Perception. He can't help notice that he doesn't seem to be enjoying himself. He looks downright unhappy. Guilty even. Who are you looking for? He flinches and glares at you. At first it seems like he's not going to answer. A girl I met a while back, he says at last, looking away. She was new in town like you. I'm just wondering what happened to her, if she's okay. He swallows. Anyway, you have any other questions? What's happening on that stage? An execution, he says, rolling his eyes. It'll be going on for a few days yet. All those folks think they'll learn great truths from the nightmares of a dying man. He shakes his head. It's not worth my time, but it might be worth yours if you haven't seen one before. Alright, let's go. Let's do it. Over here, this stage. Okay, Riss. You have a name. Who are you? Pacing the edge of the crowd is a paunchy old soldier with a swaggering stride. At the moment, however, his jauntiness seems overshadowed by worry, and he alternates between watching the execution and searching the crowd as if looking for a miracle. Then his eyes light on you. <coughs> I say, you look like someone who believes in justice. How would you like to help a poor soul wrongfully condemned? What kind of help do you need? I don't need anything, but my friend here on the platform is dying. The nightmares his executions have induced on him spill from him with every word he speaks and wrap around him like a snake. He glances at the execution. I know there are a few strands around him now, but in a few days' time, they'll choke the life out of him. I can't imagine a more horrible way to die. He pauses. Well, that's not true. I have an imagination that would shame a sailor. He leans in. You'll need to be swift and willing to hold justice above the law. But there is a way to save him if you'll hear me out. Who are you? Captain Lanchin Tybeer. Retired, he says with a little bow. Extremely retired. Once a soldier of fortune, now it's plaything. He takes another look at Riss. But my story can wait. Saving Riss's life comes first. Why is your friend being executed? A misunderstanding, he says, waving a dismissive hand. Riss and I were hired to deliver some expensive brandy to an out-of-town buyer. He breathes a sigh, weighted with disgust and regret. Would you believe that the bottles were stuffed with state secrets? Risp was accused of selling information to the enemies of Sagus Cliff. They call him a traitor. It was a travesty, he growls, 
his eyes blazing with righteous fury. The poor lad had no idea what was in there. But you did, right? Well, he says, studying the air over your shoulder, there is a place for talking about what I know and what I don't. This isn't that place. He clears his throat. If you were part of the scheme, why aren't you up there with him? Luck, he says, shrugging. I was taking a piss when they came in for him. Went through the back window and scampered up onto the roof. He shakes his head. I watched poor Riss being led away from my hiding spot. Swore I'd get him free. I hope it's a promise I can keep. Why are you helping Riss? A friendship is friendship not reason enough, he declares. Then his shoulders sag and he hangs his head. Actually, tell the truth. There's more to it than that. I'm partly to blame for him being up there. And guilt's a strong motivator, eh? I want to talk to your friend. Are you mad, Tiberius sputters? It's an execution. He's surrounded by levies. They won't let you near him. And even if they did, he's out of his head. You'll get nothing but gibberish from him. I want to try. Tiberius holds up his hands. As you wish, just don't say I didn't warn you. The levies are not to be trifled with. What's your plan? A simple one, but it requires nerve. Listen. He lowers his voice. It would be nothing for someone of your noble demeanor to masquerade as a city official and ask the, s the council clerk for an archive copy of an old stay of execution. Once you have it, I'll write out a fresh one, add Riss's name, and then we'll present it to the overseer here, and poor Riss will be set free. He spreads his hand. There you have it, a foolproof, risk-free plan. Sounds like an extremely risky plan. Nonsense, he says, waving a hand. It couldn't be simpler. Just be calm, confident, and wear a winning smile. He gives you a winning smile. Where do I find the council clerk? He'd be in the government square, of course. There's a podium outside the council tower. I can't think of a time he wasn't there. Uh, Alright, I'll help you. Excellent. Then you need a proper story and a badge of office. Fortunately... I have the first, and you can buy the second from Sangalin, the clothing merchant in the government square. He folds his arms. Once you have a badge of office, you will tell the council clerk you are from the Judicial Oversight Committee, looking into corruption in the communication of capital sentences. The stay you're asking for is that of a notorious gangster called Cole Carden, who was mysteriously set free a few years ago. When you get Cole's stay of execution, I'll make a copy with Rissa's name on it, and you can get, give it to the overseer who will free him. You see? Simple. He rubs his hands together. Now if you'll let me join you, I'd be happy to show you around the city and help you with all of this and whatever else you have going. What do you say? Thanks, I could use the help. It'd be my pleasure, but let's hurry. There's not a moment to lose. Riss hasn't much time. I'll remember that. We got a new person. Dude, nice. On my way. There's a big monster in there. And it's trying to get out. And it's not getting out. What can I do? This large, bald, broad-shouldered man turns to face you. You freeze. It's not his dark cloak or his sledgehammer. It's that beneath his moustache and goatee, he is so ugly that he'd scare his own mother in a dark alley. He gives you an abrupt nod. And you get the distinct impression that here stands a man who enjoys the boredom of standing guard and the company of his own thoughts. Nothing to see here until you pay El Jinto, he says, when it's clear. And you aren't moving on. With that, he returns his gaze to the distant sea. What is that thing in the cage? Holy shit, I can't pronounce that. A niche Thamerion, he says. El Jinto will tell you about it, if that's what you want. How did you capture the niche Them Themeron? Long story, can do drills, then falls into silence. Apparently, that wasn't an introduction, but an excuse. He sees you staring and adds, Ask El Jinto, he's the talker. I watch the beast. How does that cage hold the creature prisoner? Don't know, he says. This I'm not bothering to look at your way. El Jinto built it. I'm looking for someone to repair a device? He's already shaking his head before you finish speaking. We don't know anyone like that. We aren't from around here. Fuck you, I'm not talking to you anymore. Where's El Jinto? Are you El Jinto? You're obviously the one with the brain around here. He's just the pretty one, eh? In front of you is a weary traveller whose v grim visage is mostly obscured by a pointy hat. 
Upon closer inspection, the lines in his face indicate he has seen so much and has many tales to tell. Hello there, friend, he says. Here to see the niche theremon? My friend in the cage over there, or are you just looking to spend a word or two? I have some questions about your niche theremon. I'm going to have to get used to saying that. He's far from mine, friend, Algento says with a raspy chuckle. As you'll likely see if I get too close to the cage, he tips his hat to you. Go on, ask your questions. What is a niche theremon anyway? A biomechanical union of stubborn curiosity and frothing malice, he says. Who made them? No one can say. But they cannot be trusted or befriended. Cross their paths or thwart their incomprehensible whims, and they'll kill you if they can. Wait, you called the creature a he? Is it male? Could be. Could be female. Or genderless. Or many gendered, who can say? I have our friend imprisoned, and I feel better about the fact that I don't call him it. <laughs> How did you capture the creature? I suppose you could blame luck, he says. A little early to call it good or bad, though. His eyes seek the sky as he begins the story. I was working on... Well, I'll call it a trip. In a valley through some nameless ruin. Candidu was off hunting for dinner. And I work in a daze. Always do when I'm concentrating. A smile flits across his face. Near sunset, the trap was still in, in pieces. And I heard Candidu roaring my name. I turned just in time to see our guest bearing down on me. The creature's volley of molten energy cracked off the personal barrier that I'd left active while building the trap, but I knew it couldn't hold. Then Kanadu leapt off the valley edge onto the niche Metherion's back, bashing it with his hammer. It shrieked and then night fell, and the creature went still. Algento shrugs. It worked. A touch frantically, I admit, to, f to finish the trap. It had been designed for our guest, but as you can see, he gestures at the creature. It worked. How'd you get the creature into the city? A fair question, he says, casting a lazy glance back at the cage. But a long answer, and not as interesting as I'd like. So let's just say the trap is more uh, collapsible than it appears. What do you plan on doing with the niche thermo thermoron when you're done showing it off? We're likely to release it and run as if every kind of demon in the world is after us. We're not trappers, see, we're explorers. And we're only in this to save up some coin for a journey across a long patch of ground. He rubs the back of his neck. Not that our motives make much difference to our guest. He'll want to boil our skins once we let him go, and I can't say I blame him. I want to ask you about something else? Welcome to. I'm in no hurry. I'm looking for someone who can repair a complicated device. It must be in desperate shape if you're patrolling the circus talking to strangers, he says. Do you have a piece of the device? Might I be able to... Might be that I can offer my opinion. Yes, I have the Shard of Crystal. He accepts the Crystal Shard with great care, turning it over and over in his cracked hands. In the silence, you catch a hidden hint of wood smoke and notice that his eyes have turned slate grey. Living Crystal, he mutters at last. Seeking a greater hole. Still warm. Maybe alive. Maybe thinking. He hands the Shard back to you with a touch of regret. Interesting piece of tech. But not one I know much about. Sorry, friend. Try asking around some more. I want to see the creature up close. Your curiosity does you credit, friend. It'll only cost you 25 shins. That's too much. I'm the only one in line. How about 10 shins? 55. 95. 100, son. With the new guy. Elginto surveys you with an unreadable gambler's stare, stroking his chin with a cracked thumb. Finally, he smiles. Always nice to meet a fellow barterer, he says, and takes your money. Visit our guest whenever you're ready. With every shin, I promise, he says, pocketing your admission fee. Visit our guest whenever you're ready. Alright, let's go. Of course. The cage in which the creature floats is a simple frame and contains... A shimmering, nearly transparent cylinder of energy. It emits a low hum, barely audible, that sets your teeth on edge. The container is a delicate filigree of ornate me materials with no apparent controls, but surely they must be hidden somewhere in the traceries and protrusions of the wirework. You approach the cage cautiously. The monster within looks like a fungal blob matted with a muscular... Itch... Itch... Th the thoid? 
Thyroid? I don't know. Its multiple tentacles terminate in syringes, needles, and injectors. This mass sits atop, as is integrated with a floating orb of some type. It seems to be both mechanical and biological, with one system flowing smoothly into the next, a creation from some mad nightmare. The energy field darkens protectively and automatically as the creature throws itself at the walls, thrashing and striking mindlessly with its needle-tipped tentacles. The darkening is almost a strobe-like effect. Even as you watch, one of its tentacles coils back and blasts furious plasma at the walls of its cage. The cage holds, but the shields dim to prevent any radiation from the blast escaping. Who are you? What are you? If anything, the creature redoubles its efforts to strike at you. Its limbs are flurry of rage. How did you come to be in here? It draws away from the edge of the energy field for a moment, as if gathering its thoughts, and then it launches itself at you, rebounding off the deceptively solid solidity of the cage. Its tentacles flail wildly, the needles at the tips glinting and oozing. What can you tell me of this place? A dim light builds underneath the niche metherion. The orb at the base glowing brighter and brighter. Two tentacles stroke it. And they pull out a streamer of bright light. They stretch it between themselves, building in intensity, then they hurl it at you. The walls of the cage darken instantly. And when they light again, you see the monster within, flailing and crashing fruitlessly against the invisible walls. Can you understand me at all? The creature redoubles its effort to strike at you. Okay, examine the cage. The cage appears to be made of a mixture of synth, spun strong glass, and lightweight metal, intricately embroidered to create mind-warping patterns, evocative and strange. Energy shifts and flickers among the crevices, somehow being shaped by the form of the materials. Your closer examination reveals a small panel worked cunningly into the frame of the cage. Some of the filigrees here are worn and smooth, as if slowly eroded by friction. Perhaps these are the controls. Touch the smooth spots on the panel. The cage's hum dips lower for a moment, throbbing almost at the limit of your hearing. Your bones and teeth ache briefly, and everyone within three meters of the cage clasps their hands to their ears. You, are you trying to kill us? Leave the cage alone! He shoves you away from the cage. Do you even know what will happen if that thing gets free? Hmm. Can we do anything else with it? If we touch the cage, I assume we're going to get hurt. You reach out to the cage, your fingers hovering over some of the cunningly worked materials, and then you lay your hand on the cage. You close a circuit in the energy somewhere and you become a part of it. And strange energies jolt through your body. The shock hurls you away from the cage. If that cocks you, you've got no one to blame but yourself, you stupid tulk. Alright, alright, we are already half an hour in and we haven't even explored fucking anything of the city yet. I think there's a lot more to go. So it looks like we're going to probably have at least two or three episodes of just hanging around in town talking to people. So if you don't like that, I apologize, but I guess this is what we're going to do. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you in the next episode.